Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike. Uh, I have the two different... Um, I came here to talk as a geologist and as a climber. So I'm going to try to emerge you to the principles of chaos, how I lived through them during my climbing expeditions and during my scientific uh, uh, researching. Let's start from the, with the principle of uh, chaos. Chaos was always there, and one of the first people to, to, to look the creativity of chaos were our ancestors, the ancient Greeks, and I have to say that they thought it uh, really well. One of the three big divine features that emerged from the ancient theory of chaos was uh, Poseidon, was Zeus, and was the Addis. And this represents the cycle of, of the Earth at least, not to say the whole universe. Um, the ancient Greeks thought it really well, and still today, you see, we, we feel the thunder, we feel the, 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 the storms, we feel the natural phenomena, and somewhere there behind is hiding Zeus. We are the people of the sea, we are Greeks, we go to the sea every summer, we are amazed by the ocean, the ocean is still undiscovered, we hide, it hides lots of secrets, and somewhere down there lies Poseidon. And of course, we live, we give birth, we die, and everybody, this cycle goes, it's an eternal, and somewhere there is Addis waiting for, for the humanity, for nature, for everything. But this cycle is very general, so let me take you high. I was very fortunate 14 years ago to be one of the members of the Greek uh, Everest, National Everest Expedition. And uh, in the morning of 16th of May of 2004, if I remember well, that's the view that I took, I turned back 100 meters before the summit of Mount Everest to see a great uh, panorama. It took one more hour to cover this last 100 meters and to, to rest on the roof of the world, as they say. And there it was a really amazing moment because uh, I sat down, I took my camera out together with my colleagues, my Greek fellow climbers, and uh, it just looked to the north, to the vast plateau of Tibet, and I have to admit that Mount Everest for every climber is a dream, and for me it was a dream too. And it took eight years of a really chaotic way, crossing different paths, and uh, the moment that I took this photo, I felt in really harmony with nature. You could see how great our Earth looks from up there, despite the fact that we want to destroy, to disturb it a little bit, but still the Earth is an amazing place to live. It's our planet, it's our home. And these experiences of climbing, they are very chaotic because one, they're very powerful, has to continuously to adjust, to go back, to see. We started two times for the summit, we didn't have enough oxygen, we had to reconsider, to change plans. So it was a really chaotic, chaotic collision all the time. But by the time we stood up there, it was just for a few minutes, the perfect moment. And after such powerful experiences like this, which when for a mountain climber, it's, it's very intense, very powerful. Uh, you go back to the city, you go back to Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, and even this city looks very structured to you. Everything is nice, it's, uh, it's ordered, it's, uh, you don't have to think, you don't have to, to anticipate. It's, you just go there, you have your tea, and for when you come back to Europe, a place like a European city looks very boring. You see, nothing is happening here, everything is structured. There is nothing chaotic to a modern European city. There are other nice things, though, but when you come back from these powerful expeditions, is, uh, you want more. And then you start again the whole cycle, you get the money, you get the funding, you get your friends, you go to unexplored mountains. There are not many unexplored mountains now, but you want to live the same again. You want to live this chaotic because you're not the same every day. The mountain is not the same every day, and no matter what the satellite forecast tells you, it's always different, and you always have to adjust. And there is no comfort, and you miss your friends, you miss your wife, you miss... But this is what attracts you to go more and more back to these uh, remote places that, to be honest with you, is not for humans. It's a little hostile environment. And then you climb more, and you get more successes, you become an accomplished climber, and then your ego goes boom. But this is not a very good thing, because... Um, when your ego gets pumped up, and I have to admit that among climbers there is lots of ego and lots of like big uh, macho uh, representation of many qualities of life, and then you forget to see all these little principles, all these chaotic events, 
all these things that brought you up there. And the only time that you get to confront to the theory of chaos in mountaineering is when there is an accident, when there is a frostbite, or when there is even death. Because death is a thing that happens a lot in the mountains, and mountains is not a very common thing for humans to be. If you ask the mountain cultures around the world, they tell you that uh, they have their goats, they have the sea, but they hate the mountains because it's not an easy environment. We like to go up there, but now that I think after all these years, is, uh, the theory of chaos applies really well to all these trips, to all these expeditions. And every time there has been an accident in my climbing life, it was always a sequence of small events that eventually led to the disaster. So, very applicable in the theory of chaos without having quantified it, because I don't think it's easy. Let's go back again, back to the summit of Mount Everest. When I took my camera, it took me like 25 minutes to change the film because of the hypoxia. <laughs> it was not easy. But as I changed my films in my camera, my eyes fell on this thing. To you, it's just a pile of rocks. This scale is immense. It's just uh, 2,000 meters. And what you see here is just a, a geological fault. It's just uh, how the Earth is being created. The rocks, most of the rocks are born in the floor of the ocean. They are squeezed by immense forces for millions of years to create the mountain chains of the world that we, lucky humans, get to climb one day. But as a geologist speaking now, not as a climber, it's not at 8,850 meters, it's not a very common environment to do geological or scientific consideration or analyze the, the theoretical models. So one has to look for more human places to explore the same mechanisms, the theory of chaos, the mathematics, the complex mathematics that describe it. And this is the beauty of the self-similarity of one of the basic and universal principles of chaos. For example, one geological fault in, the, in Likavitos can have the same mechanics, the same power of the Earth, and you can see it from the humongous scale, you can see it in the very micro scale. And of course, behind that is not just one geological fault, and it's not just two arrows that are put here, but it's much more complex. There have been a theory of models and more mathematics, which I'm not going to explain here because it's going to take half of my time, not to say half of my day. But one thing that to, to hold about this theory of, of chaotic phenomena is that they equally apply with uh, measured data. If we measure a geological fault here, outside here in Athens, in Mount Olympus, in the Alps, and with random data, it's totally the same. So these principles are very global. We know that chaos is there, we know that it drives things around, and we still despise it. We still are a little bit afraid to, to, to get into that. Another, personally speaking, another sequence of events after the Mount Everest expeditions brought me to, to live semi-permanently, to live for a long time of period on Mount Olympus. And what you see here is the, the Plateau of Muses on Mount Olympus in Greece, the divine mountain of the, our ancient times. This little building there is a little refuge that I used uh, as my work and also as my place to explore my scientific uh, considerations. And of course, you see the throne of Zeus. Behind, under the cloud, is the, the summit of Greece, is the Pantheon. And when you turn your head around, you have a very nice view to the kingdom of Poseidon. You see the sea, you see the North Aegean Sea. And as a geologist, you know really well that the cycle that I said in the beginning, from Poseidon to Zeus to Addis, everything you look there, it has formed in a really sophisticated, self-organized and self-similar way. Perfect. Mount Olympus is a very touristic place, and every summer there are thousands of people that visit uh, this place. And there are lots of uh, climbers and hikers and just curious people. Other people come to there to look for the gods. Other people come there to, to talk to the rocks, like myself. And um, it's a very unique ecosystem. I don't know if many of you know, but Mount Olympus has uh, lots of plants and flowers that they grow nowhere else on planet Earth, but just there. But you see, we are very educated and we are trained to see beauty not in the abstract, not in the chaotic patterns, 
But to see beauty, for example, more people will see beauty in a perfectly organized uh, garden, um, lake. For me, this, my habitation on the mountain, next to the gods, <laughs> next to the divine feature, after a few years, after I satisfied all my climbing and my, my macho, my <laughs> egoistic uh, things about climbing and skiing, I returned back to my scientific research. And one of the very patterns, structures that I could just observe next to the refuge, not many people can see that, of course, is uh, this pile of rocks and, um, and grass and uh, the, the so-called, this is the self-organized systems called the pattern grounds. Not even many geologists are aware of that. But the more you study them, you see how our nature is very sophisticated. And even in this extreme environment, there is all the principles of chaos apply even in the big scale or in the small scale. There are lots of computer and mathematic models to explain how the dust from Sahara comes to Mount Olympus, the soil forms, then in the winter it freezes to get this result that we see here. And of course, you have to be a scientist to realize all that. But even a place like this, a place like an observatory like Mount Olympus, is um, easy to, to observe other features of chaos. Some nights, in the, some nights, for example, in the summer, it's really you get a really good view to cosmos, you get a really good view to our galaxy, cosmos. It's a, I have been amazed by certain nights watching the whole universe going round and round. So it's really, it's really there, it's with us. The whole theory of chaos, even though there are many books and many scientific publications and many models and pages and pages and codes and theories, you can see it without, even without having the proper background. For me, being a, a refuge manager, beside my scientific, my scientific uh, considerations, the most interesting aspect of chaos, even up on, on the mountain, is the social part of chaos. So, and the refuge is a very good place to, to explore and understand uh, how the theory of chaos applies within our society, which is the most complex. It's, it's very interesting to see, for example, how our modern uh, Greek society is a little um, uh, less, is a little resistant to this, to the theory of chaos, is a little less resistant than other cultures to the, to the principles of uh, self-organization, to many different principles. And it's very easy to observe that there because uh, when people arrive on the refuge, normally they, they hike there for five, six, eight hours, so when somebody is very tired and very fatigued, he's very transparent, and then it's really easy and interesting to see his uh, eating habits, his um, drinking habits, his sleeping habits, how he, he behaves with the toilet, and uh, except from all the other scientific things that I showed you, to me this is the most interesting thing. And to be honest with you, I have to say that after um, 15 years of being up there, uh, it's a little sad, it's a really realistic to admit that uh, our modern Greek culture lacks a little bit social education. We're much more educated in other things in comparison with European cultures, but in terms of social behavior, we're a little uh, behind. And for me, when uh, usually on Mount Olympus in the refuge, when the season comes in October and I have the luxury to observe the sunrise, to observe Poseidon down in the Aegean Sea, and I can recollect the memories of the season. It's like a, a really interesting to see tiny things that make a big difference, like the butterfly effect. I have to admit to you again that the, the older generations, from my generation and 40 years old and more, were a little more hesitant, a little more uh, a second thinking to adjust to the new situations. But I have to admit also that uh, the younger generations that are more receptive to the changes, they're more receptive to the, to the theory of chaos in its social expression, and they are willing to listen and uh, to do more things. So just to, to conclude here, I just have to say I'm very delighted to be here today, and I'm very delighted my whole message from this 
from this talk is that we know that the theory of house is there. We know that our generation, our modern Greek society, is still a little more rigid, a little more thoughtful about to confront to chaos, because chaos is also discomfort, but with uh, great hope and with uh, great pleasure. And being a part of this event, I have realized, especially since the crisis started in Greece, that the generations to come, they have a very big opportunity and they have their eyes open to the social, to the global, to the geopolitical challenges of the future that are happening now. And uh, today, with this TED event, let's give this generation another push to confront chaos. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.